Clap your hands to the Lord and shout with a voice of triumph. Everybody, everywhere, everybody. Oh, my. Oh, my. Hey, I could have just gone ahead and just kept on doing that for a while. Ah, Lord, you can be seated. Thank you. Thank you so much to my dear friend, Mother Flowers, Sister Flowers, your district leadership, and the Allen Event Center. What about this place? This is amazing, amazing. I know you don't believe this, but I get a little nervous at these things. Get a little uptight, so I, sometimes I like to sing an old song, you know. Man, what talent you guys have over here. I, hey, what, a couple of you young musicians came up to me last night, and I guess my reputation precedes me. They said, we know you like to sing some old songs, so we just want you to know we got you covered tomorrow night. He said, I know I'll fly away. I said, let me, tech, let me check you out. Have you ever heard this one? All that thrills my soul is Jesus. He said, no. How about this one? Someday beyond. No. You ever heard of Zion Zeal? So I better not try to sing tonight because they don't know any of them. <laughs> they're, they're, they're behind and we'll save a little time and I won't bore you with that. I rarely get asked to sing a song, but since I'm the pastor, I sing sometimes. It's what you can do when you're the pastor. So happy my wife is with me. I'm like Brother Huntley. My wife doesn't travel a lot with me. And there's no me without her. That's it. Plain and simple. I didn't have any trouble getting her to come up here to North Texas because I have a daughter and two wonderful grandsons that live just across the way. I see new life is represented here tonight. You'll notice I didn't say anything about my son-in-law. <laughs> but you just didn't let me get to it. Uh, assistant for 19 years, a gaping hole in Bossier. But you guys are blessed, and it's so good to be here with so many. I have old friends here, old friends. Brother Tenney used to tell us you can't make new old friends. I have friends here that I went to Bible school with. Houston, Texas Bible College. Those voices are way too young to remember 816 Evergreen. That's some people here I double dated with at Bible school. Illegally. I won't tell you Brother Gilbert's name, but He talked me one night, he talked me into taking his wife now, Kay. And my God, I feel like I'm, well, what am I doing up here to get all this applause? I hope you respond that good when I preach. Brother, brother, brother David Gilbert, he introduced me to Glenn Campbell. I didn't listen to that, that's worldly music. We didn't do that in our house before I met David Gilbert. He was a bull rider, he knew all about the country western, you know. It's gonna be funny if we get to heaven and find out they have both country and western music, isn't it? So he talked me and we went out to the Astrodome 
to the rodeo because Glenn Campbell was singing like a rhinestone cowboy. You, that, that was sin. Y'all don't understand. We backslid that night. A couple weeks later, we were in a restaurant. We got the confession to one of our buddies, and he got the confession. We went back to the Bible school and asked the dean if we could have a key to the chapel, and we prayed till the sun came up the next morning. We made it right, and that's why I'm here tonight preaching to you. We truly do have wonderful friends here. I have, I have sought the Lord before coming here to make certain that my motives are properly aligned with kingdom motives. It's a tremendous honor to be asked to speak at this meeting. And it's not always easy to not let your flesh get involved in this. I'm probably the only one crazy enough to say it, but this can introduce a little pride to your life. And I, I, I sought the face of the Lord. They came and said, sirs, we would see Jesus. And that's my prayer tonight. I want you to see Jesus. I'm not confident in my flesh. I'm very confident in Jesus. I'm, yeah. My, uh, my motives have changed of late when I preach. I, I want to see what Jesus can do. If we had a few people get healed of cancer tonight, who cares if you buy my CD? If that preacher walks out of that wheelchair that got ordained tonight, you'll forget my sermon, but you won't forget Jesus. Can I get a witness from somebody here? In the book of Amos chapter one, the words of Amos who was among the herdmen of Tekoa, which he saw concerning Israel in the days of Uzziah king of Judah, in the days of Jeroboam the son of the king of Israel, two years before the earthquake. Amos dated his prophecy with an earthquake because it was simple. He knew that everybody would remember that earthquake. And he said, two years before the earthquake, the word of the Lord came to me. It would be like saying, that was the year after Harvey hit the South Coast because we won't ever forget that, will we? Amos said it was two years before the earthquake over these next two nights, and it began last night. I came in on my tiptoes tonight. I, I didn't know a moment ago if I'd preach, and I didn't care. I want you to see Jesus. I want you to see Jesus. Wouldn't it be neat if something happened that would mark this moment in time Say, you, you know, that was the first year we were at the Allen Event Center. You know, that year they had the curtain. That's when they had to pull the curtain halfway across. That was before they got rid of the curtain and opened the whole place up. Wouldn't it be neat if something like that happened? Wouldn't it be neat if a pastor went home and said, yeah, it, it started at that Allen Event Center in Allen, Texas, at that camp meeting, that's when I got my word. That's when I got my vision. That's when I got a hold of something that hasn't left me. I'm gonna use an old text tonight that many of you pastors have preached on. It's in 2 Chronicles 12. It said, Shishak, king of Egypt, came up against Jerusalem and took away the treasures of the house of the Lord and the treasures of the king's house. He took all. He carried also the shields of gold which Solomon had made, instead of which King Rehoboam made shields of brass and committed them to the hands of the chief of the guard that kept the entrance of the king's house. 
And when the king entered the house of the Lord, the guard came and fetched them and brought them again into the guard chamber. We won't keep them out all the time. But just on occasion, when I head over, I want you to pull out those shields of brass. The Bible says some neat things about a shield, doesn't it? The Lord is my shield. In the New Testament, Paul talked about a shield of faith. Rehoboam inherited shields of gold. He inherited them, inherited them. The Egyptians came. These golds were pure. He replaced them with brass. Brass is not bad. Brass looks good. Brass shines up good. But it has to be polished up. You gotta keep polishing brass. It'll oxidize, it'll turn green, won't it? It'll happen in your house. Back when brass faucets were popular, down at the bottom it would start to turn. My wife and I were in the Philippines and in Hong Kong in 1984, and the hotels we stayed in had a lot of brass. The door handles were brass. The stairwells, the handrails were brass. The knobs on all the elevators were brass. And labor was cheap. And there were all kinds of men and women who went around all the time, all over that hotel with little white gloves on and rags and just steadily polishing that brass. Some of you have been over there in those places and you've seen it because you gotta polish brass a lot. Now gold will tarnish, but even when gold tarnishes, it's gold, right? 12,000 horsemen came, 1,200 chariots, 600,000 infantrymen, and there is no mention of resistance from Rehoboam. He didn't say no, he didn't petition God, and Egypt plundered the house of God because the scripture said they transgressed against the Lord. Egypt came, somebody say Egypt always a type of what we don't wanna be. And if every pastor in this church would be honest with me, they would tell you now, that's a battle in their church to keep Egypt out of our churches. You can go quiet on me if you want. We'll try to resurrect it in a minute. But what I'm preaching to you is the truth. Isaiah said, woe to those who go down to Egypt for help and rely on horses who trust in chariots because they are many and in horsemen because they are strong who do not look to the Holy One of Israel nor seek the Lord. The big question is, what are we willing to accept? Something inferior? than what God intended for the apostolic church. Rehoboam humbled himself, and the Lord had mercy on him, and Judah, the Bible said, but he had to keep polishing that brass. Every time company came and he wanted to impress them, they'd get out the brass shields and they'd shine them up because they're gonna look good. But you'll be out again next week. You'll be looking for another song and another program and another idea to polish things up a bit. I went to my superintendent's father's funeral a few weeks ago, Virgil Cox. He was a great man of God. Opened up the program and the first paragraph began to tell a story of how that Virgil, parent, Virgil Cox was a four-year-old boy. His parents were new in Pentecost. This was many years ago. And Virgil Cox died. While they were waiting on the coroner to come, he was dead for four hours. And an unnamed Pentecostal preacher came to their house on the 21st day of a 40-day fast and asked permission to pray for their dead son. And God raised him back to life. When the coroner came, Virgil Cox was alive and lived to be 88 years old. That's gold. Did you ever hear James Kilgore tell about his father crawling into the back of a hearse, opening up a coffin, and praying a dead man back to life? And the man crawled out of the hearse 
You can cover the grave hole back up. That's gold. In Frank Ewart's book, The Phenomenon of Pentecost, about the early days of Pentecost, he tells a story about seeing an old song in a church in Canada in a meeting. There was a man with a large visible tumor on his neck, and he said, we were singing this old song, Jesus breaks every fetter, and the man's tumor visibly fell off of his neck and bounced on the floor. Now here's what we do, we go find out, can I get a copy of that song? I did that, I found it, I started singing it, that's gold. My grandson's grandfather, brother, brother uh, Bobby Stanley's father, E.W. Stanley, who many of you knew, came and preached for me and my wife. He was an old man, we went to eat, we sat at a table, and he told me of things that had happened in their ministry from many years back. My wife and I were spellbound, but the one miracle I remember so well is the day he got a frantic call from parents whose two-year-old son had wandered off in play into a den of rattlesnakes. Brother Stanley said, we rushed to the hospital. The doctors gave him up. The family's in the waiting room weeping and crying He said, I walked into the room and the little boy was laying on the bed without any clothes. He was swollen up like a balloon. And he said, I counted 16 fang marks in the little boy's body, but he said, I call on the name of Jesus. He said, Brother Dean, it looked like somebody stuck a a needle in a balloon and I watched the swelling go out of his body. I went out and told the family, He's gonna be all right. That's gold. That's what got us from the sawdust at Lufkin to Allen Event Center. I'm not gonna satisfy with brass. I'm not gonna be happy to let Egypt come and steal the shields of gold. I want gold, I don't want brass. I don't wanna just look good. I don't wanna just sing if you got pain. He's a pain taker. I want the pain taker to take the pain. I don't want to just sing if you have chains. He's a chain breaker. I want to hear some chains snapping. Come on, give the Lord a hand clap. I don't know that I'll be here much longer because I think you're getting a hold of what I'm preaching to you. Let's don't be contented with anything less than the apostolic church that Jesus died for. And the only example I have is found in the 28 chapters of the book of Acts. And why should we settle for anything less than what God started in the book of Acts? Somebody shout. I need a, I need a few helpers up here, Brother Stanley. Brother Shannon, come up here. Come up here, Lincoln. Come, up, Some of you young guys. I'm gonna wear some of you older men out. I, I, I just, uh, Brother Rusty Hathcock, come up here. Brother McManus, come on up. I saw Brother Elms. Come up, guys. Y'all, y'all are long enough to get in on this. You wanna help me, Harrison? Come up here, Harrison. I can't invite one grandson and not another. I, I gotta have me some polishers up here. We gotta, we gotta get this brass polished up. Hey, where's that guy with the red socks on? Come on up here. That singer up here, come on, brother, with the red socks. If I could do that, my God, I hadn't seen dancing like that since I went to a Michael Jackson. No, I never went to a Michael Jackson concert. About halfway, I expect him to pull out a white glove there a while ago. I was in Mississippi preaching the other day, and they had a steel guitar, and I got to sing my old song, and brother, he made my song sound good. He, it, it sounded, it had that, you know how that, I had never sang with a steel guitar. Man, I almost want to start singing, he stopped loving her today. I, I, my, my God, I'm in church, I can't sing that. That's another song Brother Gilbert probably introduced me to over there. <laughs> Just, he's my dear friend. You know what, we got to polish brass. I, I, sometimes I worry about how much cheerleading we have in church. 
I worry about how much we have to pull praise out of people. That bothers me. And if it bothers me, I'm sure it bothers God. You see, I, I, I'll tell you about it tomorrow night. But I've done been to too many countries where people don't have anything closely akin to what we've got. You don't have to pull praise out of them. You have to make them sit down for the preaching. I don't have all this down. I don't have all the answers. I'm pastoring a church here in North America. Somebody said, why don't you like going overseas? I don't. I'm old enough to want to stay home. Trust me. Why do you love missions? And I'm going to tell you why. I have a fabulous, wonderful, marvelous, lovely group of people that I pastor. When I go to the pulpit on Sunday morning, I'm preaching to full people. They're loaded up with the blessing of God. When, when I go to Nicaragua, I'm, they're hungry people. And you don't have to beg it out of them or pull it out of them. And they don't care if you sing a new song. They don't care if you sing an old song. They're in love with Jesus. When you preach about heaven to them, it means something. Give him one more hand clap. I gotta hurry up here tonight. So you know, I'm trying to get this done. I wanna have revival. I, we need a harvest in Bossier right now. I looked at this congregation last night and I'm thinking, oh my God, this is a Metroplex. How long will we have to pull a, pull a curtain across? Wouldn't this be great? If you, yeah, yeah, we used to come up here and pull a curtain across there. And you mean, yeah, that was the year that God changed our mind. That was the year God said, you don't have to go home and polish up brass. Y'all help me polish a little brass, all right? Get that hand going. We can get a new song. We can get a new program. We can get some new lights. If we can get just right, if we can get everything, get a new sound system. If we can get some talent. We got talent running out our ears. We've got giftings running out our ears. But we're polishing brass thinking, if I can get a new idea, if we can get a new program, how about going back to the old past? If my people who are called by my name will humble themselves. In Chronicles, then David said, this is the house of the Lord God, and this is the altar of the burnt offering for Israel. And David commanded to gather together the strangers that were in the land of Israel. And he sent masons to hew, wrought stones to build the house of God. And David prepared iron in abundance for the nails, for the doors of the gates, and for the joinings and brass in abundance without weight, and cedar trees in abundance for, for the Zidonians and, uh, and, and, and for the Zidonians. And they of Tyre brought much cedar wood to David. David would have been a perfect tour guide for the temple, Solomon's temple. He didn't get to see it, but oh, wouldn't he have been a great tour guide. He, he could have told you everything he needed to know about it. That gold came from over there. There's a scripture that said, and David brought exceeding great plunder out of the city. Yeah, we got those trees from Tyre. They brought them all the way over here from Zidonium. They brought them all here. Those nails, I had them build those nails right there. He got everything Solomon needed. He handed Solomon everything he had to have. Solomon didn't have to go to war. He never heard the sound of swords clashing in battle. He never smelled blood on the battlefield. He didn't know the trembling sound of the heart as you run toward a giant. I know he heard the story. I know he heard the story, but David had felt the heartbeat race when he said, I come to you in the name of the Lord. And David said, we're gonna get it all together. We're gonna get it all together. You're not gonna have to find any, you're not gonna have to throw the bank, Solomon. You'll, need, you'll not need to get a loan. Every nail you need, every piece of board you need, David said to Solomon, you got it, I'm gonna get it for you and we're gonna build that temple. I'm gonna tell you the truth, ladies and gentlemen. We are here today because of some men and women David said in verse five, Solomon, my son is young and tender. 
And the house that is to be built for the Lord must be exceeding magnificent of fame and glory throughout all countries. I will therefore make preparation for it. So David prepared abundantly before his death. Look at verse 14. He said, now behold in my trouble. Somebody shout in my trouble. I have prepared for the house of the Lord a hundred thousand talents of gold and a thousand talents of silver and a brass and iron without weight for it is in abundance. Timber also and stone have I prepared that thou mayest add, that thou mayest add thereto. Moreover, there are workmen with thee in abundance, hewers and workers of stone and timber and all manner of cunning men for every manner of work. David also commanded the princes of Israel to help Solomon his son saying, is not the Lord God with you? My boy's young, my boy's tender, but David said, I got here out of my trouble. In my trouble, I've got 100,000 talents of gold. In my trouble, I got 100,000 talents of silver. I got brass and iron without weight. We don't even know how much is in those stockpiles of brass and iron. Solomon didn't know what it cost. He said he's young, he's tender, he never knew the battle. He never had to run for his life. He never ran and slept in a cave. He never heard the clash of swords. He didn't know what it meant to take the king of Amnon's crown and pluck the jewels out of it and put it on your own head. He didn't know that. The Bible said God gave him rest on every side and that's not always good for us. Our blessings can become a curse if we don't get a hold of this like I'm preaching to you tonight. He never ran for his life. He didn't know what it meant to sleep and cry out in the middle of the night. He didn't know about Goliath. He didn't know about being called a dog as Goliath ran to him. He's young and he's tender and Egypt came. He didn't buy the gold. He didn't buy the gold. He didn't get, David said, I got it in my trouble. Don't you dare let me offend you tonight. Don't you dare let me offend you tonight. It's not the will of God for me to offend you. But Egypt came. We don't have to have everything Egypt has. But I want my shield back. Living off his father's victories. Paul said, are you so foolish you haven't begun in the spirit? Are you now made perfect by the flesh? All you young people up here singing, youth congress and all that jazz, what giftings we have in our churches. I never see anything like it. Never. Hear me, young people. You got your anointing here. Keep it here. I don't care how much money they offer you. I don't care what they promise you. Don't let Egypt come and give you a shield of brass because if you do, you'll always be polishing it up. You'll be getting up walking to the pulpit saying, I wonder if we can get the right song, if we can get the temperature right, if we can get the lights fixed right. Just be sure you pray as much as you practice. Be sure you pray as much as you spend time spending setting up the lights. A light show might get them there, but it's gonna take a power in light show to keep them there. And that power's gonna come from the Holy Ghost. not a pastor in the house that don't know what I'm preaching right now. Boy, if I can come up with another sermon, if I can come up with the right word to get people to the altar, to get them to the prayer room, hallelujah. I started a security team. I don't have any trouble getting somebody to sign up to carry a concealed weapon to church. I have a little trouble getting them to the prayer meeting, but I can get them on the security team. We got everything backwards here, ladies and gentlemen. 
I'm fixing to preach to you in the next few minutes. We got it backwards. I'm not against the lights and you people jumping up and shouting an amen. I got two things to say to you. I'm glad I said something you can shout amen about, but let me tell you, we got it all at home, but that's not enough. That's a little brass and there's always a light flickering up there. Somebody's gotta run, try to fix a little something going on in the sound system. Not enough monitor, you know. Somebody's not not getting the volume they want. It's just always polishing, 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 but somewhere in a closet, if one person, one righteous man. Tell you about Brother Shannon's grandfather. Brother Shannon, he said, yeah, when you go see him, he'd wake you up in the morning, laying on that living room floor, calling on God. He wasn't trying to let you sleep in. He's trying to wake up heaven. He told me he went to see his doctor. He's already close to 90 years old. And the doctor said, you're gonna have to get a new doctor. He said, I've got cancer, I'm gonna die. And Brother Stanley said, no, let me go home, go on a three-day fast. I'll come back and pray for you. An almost 90-year-old man went on a three-day fast and came back and prayed for that doctor. Brother Stanley's out here somewhere. Somebody ought to say amen. I heard, I heard later the doctor died. I said, I heard your doctor died. He said, not from cancer. Come on, Brother Youngblood. Come on, get up here. I need some polishers. Boy, if I could get a sermon, if I can get the right series, you know? I tell you what you do. If we can get a few people healed of cancer, I'd trade every light, every smart light, every LED light. I'd trade everything in the church. If those three people at home right now going through chemotherapy would call me Monday morning, but I got news for you. You can have your lights, you can have your PA system, and thank God for it. My good friend John Mahoney's here helping you. I love every bit of it, but I need more than that. And we don't have to give it up if we'll revisit the old past. Clap your hands and shout. Shout. I grew up in the loins, came out of the loins of a man who gave it all up to be a one God. Jesus is main preacher. Left his job, left his security. Went to McGregor, Texas. That's in your district, isn't it? Went to McGregor to an old house. Used to pass out the offering plate, he said. And it came in just like it went out. Wouldn't even have a penny in it. Going broke. I've never prayed for groceries to feed my kids. My daddy had to pray for groceries to feed his kids. Moved us down to DeLeon, Texas. That's in your district too. That was the center of the universe when I was a little boy growing up. But my dad, after many years of fruitless ministry, he found a prayer room in the garage. I think I have a picture of it to show you. In that garage, he built him an altar. Five o'clock in the morning, he met Jesus before he met man. He met Jesus before he met man. I started to bring the old Bible I have of my dad's in the last 11 years of his ministry. 892 people, the date they were baptized in the name of Jesus is recorded in that Bible. God gave him the gift of faith. He didn't have to call people to repentance. I'm not against any of that. We've done it at home. He didn't have to get the church to shouting. He just laid his hands on them. They got the Holy Ghost like they did in Acts chapter 10, but he got it in that prayer room. Put that picture back up there. 
and leave it up there just a minute. That's where he wrestled that out of the hand of God. He wrestled it right out of the hand of God. He never lost the fire. He never got over getting the Holy Ghost. He never, he sold out to Jesus and everything and I'm up here riding on his shoulders. You can't improve on that prayer room. My wife's little dad has Alzheimer's today. His pastor, Bob Meyer, has been so kind to him in Paris. He's, got, he's in final stages of Alzheimer's who left his home, he left his job, went out to help a man start a home mission church in Colorado, started his own home mission church in Colorado. You know what? They didn't have giftings. My dad never had a great music program except in De Leon. We probably had in Freon. We had good musicians, not in Colleen. He never had a good music program. He never finished a message. He never got through preaching. He just preached and God would move. And when he got through, he'd get everybody laughing and then call for the altar and people would get the Holy Ghost. Drives me crazy. I'm digging out a sermon. I'm asking God, I'm gonna read every book I can read. I'm gonna steal from anybody I can steal from. I'm gonna polish up all the brass I can. I'm gonna listen to Brother Huntley. I'm gonna write every seed thought I heard today. I'm gonna take it home and try to get Bozier stirred up and try to get Bozier moving. And I had Terry Schock come and evaluate me and my life and our church. And he took me to Starbucks and he pulled out a legal pad and he said, I'm gonna ask you some questions, uh, Brother Jim. Jerry, he said, when do you pray? How long do you pray? What days do you fast? How long do you fast? I thought we was gonna have a church plan and church growth meeting, you know? I said, Brother Shock, am I, am I under investigation here? Am I on trial? He said, you want me to help you? You want me to help you? He said, I can't help you if you're not praying. If we get people to talking to God before they talk to men, there'd be fewer people in our offices looking for answers to marriage problems. If you'd pray to you prayed through. I'm not a good marriage counselor. I can sum it up in two words. Quit being selfish and shut your mouth and you ought to be able to get along with each other. Boy, I didn't have to say that, did I? They'll dock my check for that probably. Amen. We gotta polish it up. We gotta get the brass going. I got an email that David said, in my trouble, in my trouble, in my trouble, I walked through some things. I had to do some fighting. I did some war on the floor. I cried out to God in a cave and said, God, where are you? You've left me here alone. He'd cry out to God in a cave. He didn't know what to do. He was anointed, but he didn't look blessed. But in my trouble, I got enough gold to build a temple. Oh, it was easy for Rehoboam to let the world come in and take the shields of gold and replace them with something you gotta polish up every few days. I don't want that and you don't want that. I know this about people who come to camp meeting. They are hungry to have a book of Acts church and why don't we get on our way tonight? I wish you'd lay, I wish you'd turn around and lay hands on somebody right now and say, listen, let the seed of this word get in my heart. Let the seed of this word get in my heart right now, right now, right now, right now. I wish you'd lay hands on their head, really. We're doing the cute thing. We're doing the brass thing. Put a little hand on your shoulder. What about putting a hand on their head? What about getting a little sweat on your hand? What about praying until the fire falls? Somebody gets healed of cancer. What about it? What about it, North Texas? What about it? Pray in the Holy Ghost. Somebody by you may not even have the Holy Ghost. You can lay hands on them, they'll start speaking in tongues right now. It's a sign for every believer, isn't it? What do you mean you have to have the gift of faith? 
These signs shall follow them that believe. Yes, we don't want brass. We don't want to polish brass. We want shields of gold. North Texas, let's go get the gold shields back. How about it? North Texas. Hashara Baro Bohoshe Kebe Ahaya Isha Katahaya Lato Kohoye Ambahaya. God's speaking to us right now. And if we couldn't have our gold back, he wouldn't challenge us through this message to get the gold back. He wants us to have gold shields. I need that bad to the bone organ player up here, either one of them. I used, to, I used to try to do a little marriage counseling. I was trying to help a boy. I was trying to help a boy in his marriage counseling and trying to help him and his wife, young men. And, and I'd talk to him. Everything was, I don't care. I don't care. You're gonna lose your kids. I don't care. You're gonna lose your marriage. I don't care. You're gonna wind up broke. I don't care. Everything I always, I heard it a hundred times. I don't care. I don't care. I don't care. You better kick that attitude out of your life and out of the church. Somebody wake up right now. We don't want to have an I don't care attitude. Well, we got a good church, but we do polish it up an awful lot. Pastor does have to make a real strong plea to get people to prayer meeting. Are you listening to me? We're going somewhere right now, ladies and gentlemen. Every young person in this building, every young preacher, listen to Pastor Dean. You don't have to have the giftings if you've got Jesus. And I want to introduce you to Jesus tonight. And let's never be content to be cheated out of what God wanted for the last day, church. J.H. Osborne showed us something in the Word that I never forgot. I'm closing Exodus 22 and 21 and 22. And Moses was content to dwell with a man, and he gave Moses Zipporah, his daughter, and she bare him a son, and he called his name Gershom, and he said, I've been a stranger in a, in a, in a, in a strange land. Moses, 80 years old, 40 years removed from Egypt. The Bible said he was content. He was content to dwell with a man. Brother Osborne showed me in the original language, the word content means to be weak-minded. He don't even own his own sheep. He's hurting his father-in-law's sheep. He tried and he failed in Egypt. His own people bailed out on him. He got offended, ran for his life. Am I right? He's out in the wilderness trudging along and he's contented. He's been cheated, that's what's happened to him. He's been cheated. God saved his life as a baby. Didn't he do that? Didn't he put him in Pharaoh's house and raise him? Didn't he grow up with the finest and the best and, the, and all that jazz? Am I right or wrong? Didn't he have an opportunity? But he got offended and he's out here in the wilderness with some sheep that he don't even own. And he's cheated. It's like going to Walmart and buying an item that's 10 bucks and they ring it up for $14.99 and you say, well, what's five bucks? I don't wanna go through the trouble and you just give that five bucks to Walmart. You're just happy to do it to save your little precious time, right? Some of you wouldn't do that. Some of you would block traffic for 10 miles to get your $5 back. 
But some of you are like me. I ain't gonna sit here and fuss with this lady over five dollars, and that's where Moses was. He was in the wilderness. He wasn't even herding his own sheep. He was satisfied. He was contented and locked up inside of him were the first five books of the Bible. Think about it, ladies and gentlemen. If he had stayed there, we wouldn't have had in the beginning God. If he had stayed there, we wouldn't have had 10 commandments. We wouldn't have known about the Red Sea. He was a private and he was staying there and satisfied to be a private when he had a general locked up in him. God didn't call him to be a private. God didn't call him to be contented. And it took a burning bush and a whole lot of God talk to wake him up and realize, I've got a mountain called Sinai. And if you can get there, Moses, me and you gonna talk face to face. I wonder what's locked up in the future of North Texas district. I wonder how many churches are locked up in the womb of this district. No. We do care, and we will not be contented. Somebody help me preach right now. We're moving. We're moving on up. We're moving on up. We're coming after our shields of gold. God gave them to us, and we're going to be satisfied with nothing less. That's it. Pray in the Holy Ghost. Pray all by yourself, it don't matter. That's hunger. Brother Wolfram goes in and out of Vietnam, they won't let him live there. He's been in and out a hundred times. He sent me a picture one day of a man who was converted to truth by a young man he wanted the Lord named Brother Koa. He sent him to the Philippines to Bible school. Brother Brother Koa converted a man who owned a Bible school. He was a Mennonite preacher. I think I have a picture of him. They destroyed his Bible school. They beat him to a bloody pulp. You know what he did? He went home and sucked his thumb. Said, well, God must not love me. Things are not going well. That's what we'd do. God didn't call me to be a martyr and to be beat up. (laughs) No, that ain't what he did. He got up. Somebody gave him some land. We raised them some money. And they built them a Bible school. They're riding motorcycles all over Vietnam. They're baptizing people in the muddy rivers of Vietnam, not by the tens or twenties, but by the thousands. And I'm not gonna be contented, Brother Foster, just to have my crowd. I'm not gonna be contented just to have what I got. That's not what he wanted. The church multiplied. I'm preaching too long, help me. You gonna polish brass? Are you going to get your shields back tonight? If you're going to get your shield of gold back, I want you to clap your hands and shout. I wonder what would happen if we did that for about another 20 seconds. We ought to create an earthquake. Hey, you remember? Hey, you remember? That was in the event center in Allen, Texas. That's when it started. Yeah, two years before the earthquake. That's when it started to happen. There's a pastor going home looking for 20 more seconds. Can you give me 20 more seconds? Can you give me 20 more seconds? Come on, North Texas camp meeting.